Well, nice to finally see you, Scott. It is nice to see you again, my friend. I, um, I kind of, like I said, I was just about to uh, um, reach out in, in Boston, but uh, it kind of never materialized. So I'm very happy to see you now. Yeah, well, you know, Boston is a, I mean, it's a fantastic city overall. I spent mm. 20 years there myself, did my uh, undergraduate and graduate work and started my career there. And now, of course, it's, it's home to uh, content marketing world and, and other conferences. I'm uh, not content marketing, marketing profs. Yep. Um, but that brings us to here in Cleveland. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Now, are you, are you a regular here in Cleveland? Well, basically, yes. I uh, met Joe when I was in Belgium in 2010. I was working at uh, Towers Watson at the time, an American consultancy company. And I told him my story and he said, well, what you're doing is basically content. So I'm doing a little get together in, uh, in September 2011. Why don't you come over and tell your story? So I said, uh, OK. And I hopped on a plane and I went to the Renaissance and uh, Boom, I was there. But it was it was just like that? Like like Joe said you should come over and yeah. you that that's pretty impressive when yeah, you think that's about what it. I thought Somebody as well. can convince you to come overseas for yes. you know, a little conference. I mean Yeah, and it was good fun. I mean I, I, I basically learned the fact that I was doing content at a, at a doc, at another conference in Amsterdam with uh, Seth Godin. And uh, I thought, hey, I had never heard of Joe Polizzi or content marketing or whatever. Right. And uh, then one of my friends invited me to this dinner in Belgium. And then I met Joe and he said, come on over. And then I started reading all these books and whatever. And, 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 and then I crossed Anne Handley and C.C. Chapman in the Hall of the Renaissance. And I said, hey, C.C. did not know who I was, obviously. So I said, no, what are you doing these days? And I thought, oh, no, he doesn't obviously know who I am. So yeah, that was good fun. I mean, there were 600 people there. I had to uh, uh, go after Marcus Sheridan on stage, so that was uh, a really nice act to follow. But uh, so, no, it's, uh, so what's your assessment? I mean, wh when you compare uh, uh, the marketing industry in Europe mm. to that of the United States, mm. to me, it, it seemed like there's always been a bit of a lag in terms of adoption, mm. uh, social media in particular. Yeah. How about as far as content marketing? Have you have you seen kind of a parallel growth? Is one a little bit ahead of the other? Well, um, I partnered up with uh, with Bert, one of my uh, mates, of, who I'm, who I met here at Content Marketing World a few years ago, and we now have a company called Content Marketing Fast Forward, and we did a research study uh, a few years ago hmm. on the maturity level of content marketing in Europe, and we found out that it was. Uh, lagging a little bit behind, okay. but getting there. I mean, the UK was about, I, I think, half a year behind or something, and, and mainland Europe about a year or something, it's but uh, it was not bad. Yeah. No, and I think we're gaining very fast. So uh, we have access to the English language literature and we've kind of a, an entrepreneurial um, spirit, if you will. So the Nordics and the Western Europe are, are, are getting better at it. Southern Europe is a bit more difficult yeah. because of the fact that, well, they're, they're relying more on other tactics and, and, okay. and so uh, I think we're getting there yes okay so wh what do you what do you feel like right now at least is the driving force in content marketing what's providing the most momentum going forward yeah that's a very good question I mean there's so much out there I mean we've just started this conference and uh, we've been already been bombarded with all things that are that are new and, and up and coming and, and video and, and AI and what have you. So I'm very interested. I've not made my mind up yet. What do you okay. think? Um, well, certainly um, I think marketing automation is getting a fair, uh, you know, a, a fair bit of conversation right now. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the, the challenge, and, and, and when you talk about marketing automation, it's you know, your traditional CRM stuff, but now we're seeing it creep into um, artificial intelligence mm -hmm. more and it's been shown that bots can can create content just like humans can now i'm uh, while while i acknowledge that that happens uh, that that is possible i still wonder whether it's reasonable that ai can create content that is quite as emotionally compelling mm -hmm. As humans can. 
I mean, do, I, do, you, I, do you think that's a question of time? Because AIs can do a lot already, and, and through machine learning, I guess, they will do a lot more in the coming uh, years, I, I guess. I, I think that's the case. I think that the systems are getting smarter. Um, I, I don't think it is uh, necessarily fair to simply dismiss them because they're machines. Mm. Uh, I think we've seen over and over again that, that machine learning actually um, not only can mimic and um, compete with humans, but in some cases may surpass humans. I mean, you think about what, what the reasonable need right now is for an editor. Mm. You know, a writer does his or her job, and then an editor goes through that and, and cleans it up, essentially. Well, if you're doing AI-generated content, why do you need an editor anymore? So no. basically what you're saying is maybe there's going to be a, a shake out of people that are doing maybe um, commodity work or maybe average work like Jay Akunzo said this morning. There's a lot of things going on and everybody uh, is doing average stuff like everybody else is. So it's well, one, one would hope that we get rid of the mediocre, but then what, what happens? You know, then now all of a sudden you've got a shift mm -hmm. of the core group of people that are suddenly more talented than they were before. So that's the new average. Who's exceptional in that situation? I, so I think the, it's the a, bar is being raised at that point, you yeah, mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, I, you know, is there an element of human creativity that can't be surpassed by AI? Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that. Well, the funny thing is, in, in Holland, we had an experiment uh, done by a big brand, and they put together an algorithm that would paint the next Rembrandt. And so they looked at all the pictures of Rembrandt over the course of the last years that he was alive, obviously. And then they said, well, okay, to the machine, now re recreate that. And it was a genuine great piece of content that they made a whole movie and video about it. And it was astonishing that it was actually looking like an undiscovered Rembrandt, if you will. So maybe that is, that is the future of creating content. I'm, I'm not really sure, like you said, if bots or machines can be as creative as humans can be, but uh, yeah, yeah. that would probably be very scary as well. Well, that's the thing. I mean, to the degree they can mimic the known, where is the opportunity for the unknown? And, and, and to me, that's where the human creativity comes from, is, is by being inspired by different things and being able to bring those things mm -hmm. together to create something new. I mean, when you describe it like that, certainly a machine can process two disparate things and, and go in a third direction, but how likely is it that anything will come of that? You know, I know, I know the, the people that are pro-AI will tell you that that's coming. Uh, and, and the skeptics, like me, I guess, uh, well, see, so, you know, there, there is still some, there is still some corner of the human mind that will remain forever unique, that will remain the, the, the unpredictable, the creative, the artistic, that even through machine learning, I don't think you can teach. And, and do you think that that will always be the case? I mean, that's I, a bit of a I, I hope. crystal ball, I guess. But. <laughs> Whether it's likely or not, I think in the next in the next five to ten years, we're going to see massive uh, massive progress in this area. The ten to twenty years beyond that, I think, is anyone's guess at this point. But in, on, the, on the other side of the spectrum, humans, actual humans. Have, have a lot of um, um, technology now just to produce content um, and the, the, the barrier to entry is almost none. I mean, my son is an avid content maker. He has a YouTube channel and he's very good at, uh, at video and editing and, and what have you. What's, what, what's his topic? What does he, what does he make videos about? Um, he makes uh, stop motion movies. He's very creative. Wow. He's 12. And um, he tends to go to the mall and interview people with his friends. <laughs> That's really interesting. Yes. How old is your son? He's 12. He's 12 and he still goes to the mall. Yeah. 
there, there have been instances where, uh, at least here in America, we've seen teens um, kind of eschewing the mall, uh, okay. saying, you know what, I can connect with my friends on Snapchat, yeah, true. on Instagram, on yeah. YouTube, on FaceTime. Yeah, true. You know, no longer do we need to wait for mom and dad to ask for a ride yeah. to the mall. We're connected already. But the fact that he actually still sees value yeah. in FaceTime, literal FaceTime, literal not, FaceTime. not me mechanical FaceTime, yeah. that's really encouraging. Yeah. I, I must admit that he's, um, he's, he's going a little bit away from that actual FaceTime. And now, since I gave him my old Mac, he's now doing ah. all kinds of other things <laughs> online, well, which I thought I gave him the Mac to just edit the videos and now he's using the mac to play like uh what's the game again uh minecraft minecraft or, yeah exactly. of course he's on minecraft yeah so like he's minecrafting and he's facetiming his friends and skyping his buddies to create things online so that okay this is <laughs> backfiring now to me because that was not the point of giving him the mac right so yeah well I, well i think uh when you think about youth and technology Mm. It's like, it's like water. Water will always find a way through something. Mm. You know, it, it, it will either find its way through the smallest crack, or if the crack isn't big enough, it will find its way around. True. And, and I think uh, teens and preteens and technology, they will find a way to work with these things. And that's Definitely. that's not just teens and preteens. I mean, that's that's a human thing. We are naturally we are a naturally curious species. Mm. And we want to we want to understand the mechanics behind stuff. We want to understand the why. We w and we want to communicate with other people. And if there is a shortcut that allows us to do that, we will take we it. will take that all day long, right? The, it, I'm not really sure how it is here in the U.S., but are marketers educated in a way that looks forward instead of backwards? I mean, I mean, are they? Are the new marketers there that come on the market, uh, um, the hybrid markets that we've been hearing so much about? Are, is the education system on marketing in the U.S. Yeah. a good one, or are they just rehashing old marketing material? And then when they come on the market, they say, "Oh my God, what's happening? I'm not really sure what's going on." Well, it's interesting because um, you know I, I, I see people discovering these concepts that, again, have been around not only for five, 10 years, maybe 50, 60, 70 years mm. in the world of marketing. You know, I, and that's why you know, I, I talked about this in, uh, in my speech uh, earlier today. Understanding the fundamentals of the human condition, understanding what motivates people, uh, having an appreciation for history and literature and the classics, being able to look back to be able to predict the future, mm. I think is absolutely essential for marketers because otherwise you're stuck in a, a fairly small window of time where you're just looking at trends from the last five years and into the next five years. And you go back another five years, 15 years before that, you'll see stuff that can actually help you avoid mistakes that you're about to make, albeit on, on different platforms and with different technologies. And, and are these youngsters then looking back that far to take that baggage forward or not? I don't, I don't think they are. I mean, you know, probably, uh, you know, you, you share this with me and that is you've, you've earned your scars. Hmm. You know, you, you've learned from mistakes. You've observed the marketplace. You've observed some of the major players in the market and you've seen what works. You've also seen what doesn't work. Yeah. And it is by virtue of your unique experience during this particular time and place that you practiced your craft, that you were able to hone your worldview about business, about marketing, about human beings. Someone just coming out of school doesn't have the benefit of that experience. And yeah. you know, this is not something that's unique to 2017, mm. generations have been dealing with this since time immemorial. But do you think they still have that persistence to um, muddle, muddle along, if you will? And, and because I, I, 
I, I come at companies and, 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 and there are people there and after a few months, it's very difficult, so we're going to move on, you know? Um, is that a sign of the times of the generation that we're coming to market now, or is it just... I, I think, I chalk that up to human nature. I, I don't think that it's unique to this, uh, this generation. Um, I do think, and, and I'm not just talking about, about marketing and, and business now, but I, I think just generationally, I think previous generations read a lot more. Yeah, you know? in actual uh, books, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> books still work. Yeah, right? true. I mean, true, true. And, and, and in as much as uh, e-books were supposed to overtake hard copy books mm. five years ago, they still have them. Yeah, like, although I a... love my Kindle. What's that? Although I love my Kindle. Oh, well, of course. Which is really handy. And, and why? Why do you love your Kindle? Well, because you can actually uh, highlight stuff and yeah. then you can afterwards, you like have, have an automatic summary and things. Yeah. Where I normally tend to do books and then yellow, how do yeah. you call it? Um, which takes a lot of time to recap things. It, do, well, it does, and then it's not easy to search no, in your physical not. library. Right? Not true. And you know what else is that when you get on a plane with your Kindle, you can carry your entire library yeah. with you. Whereas you're lucky if you could get one thick book with you in, yeah, your, in your briefcase. So but there's, there's a benefit there. That's true. But I, I, like, I still like the, the feel of the books. I'm a bit of an oh, old-fashioned person, I guess. I completely agree. And to me, there is no better smell yeah. in the world <laughs> than walking into a used bookshop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, that is pure love. But kind of getting back to this, you know, I think the, the day and age we're in now where, you know, notifications and text alerts and Instagram messages and, and uh, all the rest, are vying for our attention and are yeah. interrupting us every single day. I think mm. we've lost the ability to concentrate on the long form, whether it's long form online or long form in, in a physical book. Yeah. And I think that, to me, as a classics major, as an undergrad, <clears throat> this is where I got the most value, is being able to read critically yeah. and to think and to write and to, and to process things and bring them together. You know, I wasn't interrupted by all these things. No, true. And, and I, I almost feel like, personally, like, like I've lost that ability now myself. I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, it's very difficult. If, if I see my children uh, studying or reading or doing all kinds of things that need their attention, I always say, come on, get rid of the iPhone. That's right. I mean, get rid of that. The social pressure that they are under, that is incredible because, oh, I mean, really if, they, if they don't Snapchat for a day, they, hold, they lose their whole story thing, you know, and they give their uh, password to friends who then text for them or whatever. I mean, it kind of mind-boggling for me that, they, that, that, so, that, that, that there is so much pressure on them to be online all the time. That's so right. having the attention span um, back to them to actually read a book or do something else, is, is very hard because the social pressure of being in the game and having that community right. online all the time is very high. Well, you know, to kind of circle back to the, the top of our conversation where we, we were talking about AI yeah. and machine learning, well, a machine can digest all of those books. It True. can digest the, the, the material from centuries mm. of content. And now on the other side, on, on the human side, You've got youth that has trouble getting through 140 characters, yeah. um, and, and it, it you know the, the two are just just feeding into each other. Where you've got this lack of interest or lack of ability to concentrate on the long form and process everything that it means, along with machines that are doing it better than you ever could in the first place. Yeah, true. That's a, a that, that's a really uh, dystopian future uh, if that's so the way are that we it's doomed? going. What's that? Are we doomed? I hope not. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think humans will allow that to happen. No, quite true. frankly, um, I, I don't want to. I don't want to end this on a, <laughs> on a on a high, a really <laughs> sour note, right? But I, I think we're better than that, I, and yeah. I think we can recognize when, um, certainly when our species is um, is being affected, but also just reading and and processing these things for pure enjoyment. Yeah. You know, I think we'll always want that. 
And is that something that we can take into account for uh, the future generation of marketer as well? I mean, do they have to be taught to relax and chill and actually read some more stuff from the past to take forward? I would hope that the marketers of the future would be naturally curious and, yeah. and want to absorb this stuff on their own. Mm. And I think that, again, that's where the best marketers come from is people that are interested in the the science of marketing, you know, mm. the hard facts and analytics and all the ins and outs that you need to learn, and on the soft side, you know, where, where it takes a little more thinking, it takes empathy, mm. and, and, and it takes processing of, uh, you know, some of these great concepts. And so that, that, that journalistic mind that you talk about, that's, that's great for content uh, marketing, obviously, then. Yeah. I would hope so. Yeah. I would hope so. So I'm glad we're not doomed. <laughs> well, nice to be human with you, sir. Thanks. Thank you.